Good evening and welcome to the last in the series on the resurrection. Tonight we're going to be looking at friendship. And just to recap, over the last three weeks we've looked at crossing over from one reality to the next. And we live in that reality now by the Holy Spirit. God has given us the Holy Spirit so we can now live out a resurrection life. And week two we had a look at adoption, the Holy Spirit. And one of the main things the Holy Spirit does uh, for Christians is to proclaim to our hearts in an experiential way that we are God's children. He tells us that we're dearly loved children of God, and then he pours out God's love into our hearts. And then thirdly, uh, last week we had a look at the kingdom reality. Jesus is now crowned king. He's going to be king eternally, and that kingdom is going to be made new one day, uh, new heavens and new earth. But that's, he's no, it's no less a reality that he's king today, right now. And he's functioning as the king. He's busy and he's at work. And he's inviting each of us to be part of that work, to come and serve him. And he gives us gifts and talents and, and he gives us grace to do all the works of service that he asks us to do. But he also empowers us by the Holy Spirit. We saw that in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2, that the disciples and apostles were empowered to go out and proclaim the message. And whatever work of service he asks you to do, he gives you the Holy Spirit to give you that power. And we saw how the empowerment is not necessarily like a superpower that you find in a Marvel movie, like you're just given a special suit like Iron Man and then you can go and battle. But actually the power is a just an ability to carry on and do the things that God asks you to do. If you don't want to do them, you're in a hostile environment and there are severe consequences. You can do them because the empowerment that comes through Christ, he doesn't give us anything that he, uh, he expects us to do that we, he won't give us the ability to do it. So that was last week, the kingdom of God. And those are the three weeks that we've had a look at. And today we're going to look at the last in our resurrection series, which is friendship. And who doesn't want friends, right? What's a great thing to have uh, in this life is to have friends, people that you're close and intimate and connected with. Um, you know, we know what it's like to not have friends and to have people around. Maybe some people are, are in that stage in their life. They don't want any more friends. I don't know. But there's, there's like we've just been through two years, uh, a couple of years ago. We had COVID and then we got estranged from one another. And we found it very difficult. And as the, there's a as God was an underlying reality of the lack of connection that we have with one another because we don't have very good friendships. And actually in this country alone, it's often said there's an epidemic of loneliness. It's not just because people are not don't have uh, relationships and family, but they're not interrelated to one another in a friendship sort of sense. They can't rely on people to be around them in life. And we know how important that is for our well-being, but just to be human in life. And it's just as important to God. In fact, that's the reason why we have that longing it's because we're made in the image of God and God is somebody who wants to have friends. Really early on in the Bible, uh, there's a chap called Abraham and he was called and named a friend of God. This is way before Moses. I think Moses is called that. But the person who's described the most as the friend of God is Abraham. And that was at the wrong side of the cross. That was at way before Jesus Christ was crucified and he was called a friend. And what we're going to learn today is that now, on the right side of the cross, this new resurrection life means that God wishes and desires to call us friends. Now, just before we do that, let's have a look at um, what it's like not to be on that in that reality. And most of us will know what it's like to work for someone who's not very easy to work with and they're a difficult boss. We had a little bit of a story last week about when I was a salesperson, I looked used to work for someone who didn't particularly like me and I found it very hard to get on with them and they found it hard to get on with me for some reason and no matter what I did, I couldn't do enough. It was just never up to the right standard, even if I wanted, because I wanted to try hard enough and I wanted to learn the job, it still wasn't good enough. And sometimes it's the other way around though, isn't it? Sometimes it's because the manager's trying their best, but the person doesn't want to do the job. I uh, used to have that uh, my last job in McDonald's where uh, there was just people that just rock up to the job and they just probably didn't realize how difficult it was and how much hard work and stress was involved and they just didn't want to do it. And some of them lasted a little while, but most of them didn't last very long. 
God has given mankind a job, and that particular job is to obey his law. And we as employees, if you like, have failed that task miserably. Um, Not because God is capricious boss that's really trying to raise the bar and make our life very, very hard, and so we can't grasp onto it, but rather because we are bad employees. Uh, We've chosen to go our own way rather than go his It's the other way around sort of thing. Because of that, we are on the wrong side of the resurrection, uh, under the law. We no longer have a relationship with God that we can call a friendship. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus comes to us in order to help us understand this reality. And he preaches God's law. And Matthew chapter 5 is the Sermon on the Mount. And if you ever read for the Sermon on the Mount, you might think to yourself, first of all, it doesn't sound uh, exactly like the Ten Commandments that was given to Moses. It sounds a lot different in many places. The reality is that Jesus, what he's doing is trying to convey the law that's been written on our hearts as human beings since the dawn of time, right back in the Garden of Eden. It's a law that says this is what a human being is. This is how to live life and to please God. And in in order to do so, we need to do it perfectly so that we may stand before God righteous. And Jesus explains this law in such a way to give us a hint that we don't face up to that reality. And the law is uh, told in such a way as he says that if you've heard it said that do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully have already committed adultery with her in his heart. He says, like, inside your heart, you commit adultery with somebody. And that adultery is no less than the adultery that was described in the Ten Commandments. He goes on to say that this, this adultery that you commit can throw you into hell. The punishment is still just as severe. There's a real punishment at the end. There's consequences for disobeying God's law. And then he goes on to talk about loving your enemies and giving from the needy and making sure that when you pray, you pray in a secret space, that you don't want other people to see your good works and that you don't tell your brother he's a fool and uh, and be angry with somebody in the wrong way. Do not judge others and so on. And all these laws, Jesus is pointing out, this is the law of God. This is the way it always should be. Look at it carefully and examine yourselves. Do you live up to this law? What's interesting is Jesus, that before he says all this, says this about the law. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He says, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Did you notice that? That if we do not live up to the standard that Jesus is laying for us, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It says right there in the last verse, in verse 20, he says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of Pharisees and teachers of the law. And if you've read any of the Gospels, you know these were very fastidious, fastidious, uh, zealous, religious people that perhaps if we were living back then, we would have looked up to and admired because of the religiosity. And Jesus is saying to us that your righteousness has to surpass that. The word righteousness here is that legal term that you give to someone when they've been declared right in a court of law. It's in God's court. He's saying that that is the standard of righteousness that's only acceptable to enter the kingdom of heaven. And if we were honest with ourselves and we have looked at this reality, we would realize that you and I are bad employees. It's not because these are high standards. I just can't quite lie. If you just lower the standards, God, if this law wasn't so difficult, I can make it. It's actually the way we were created. We ourselves go against our own nature, our own way of being, that we are created in the image of God to be. And we have chosen a different path. We chose to go against these laws. Now, what is the consequence of that? Well, as we've heard that Jesus says, the consequence of that is that abandonment for God 
uh, and we are condemned, and therefore we earn the punishment of hell. You and I not meeting up to that standard that God asked for and not having the righteousness that surpasses that of a Pharisee means like them, we stand condemned. And that is why Christ has come, so that he is the one who obeys the law. He is the one who then goes to the cross and then dies for everybody's sin, faces the punishment for that sin, and then rises to life because he is the one that is righteous. No one else, just Jesus. Jesus is the righteous one. And it's those of us who've come to believe that and put our faith in Jesus, who have our sins forgiven because of Jesus' work, and then are also given his righteousness so that we may stand before God on the day of judgment and claim Christ as our righteousness and not ourselves. So that God doesn't look at us and say that your righteousness does not surpass that of a Pharisee. But rather, he says, your righteousness is Christ. The reason why that is, why did Jesus come? Because he wants us to be in a relationship as a friend. So that we will no longer be in this slave condemnation mentality. We will no longer have a relationship with God that's constantly got before us uh, condemnation. And we're cut off from God. We're guilty of this sin. Jesus makes a way. And because Jesus is now taking all the condemnation for our sin, there's now nothing less left other than a relationship with him as a friendship. And we get to see that friendship played out a bit more in John 15, where Jesus talks about how he wants to, us to be close to him in this most intimate fashion. He brings his disciples together and he sits around a table and he eats food. And he describes to them this new reality that he wants to give them. And I'll just read that to you in John 15. He says, as the Father has loved me, so as I loved you. Now remain in my love. And then he goes on to say, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. I have no longer called you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business, but I now call you friends. This is just before Jesus would die on the cross. And he would go on to uh, point out that the this Holy Spirit, he would give them. And on that day, they will know and bear witness to Christ. But it's the friendship that God is speaking. Think back to your friendships that you know right now. Think back to how those relationships work and how they're different to the stranger on the street or the boss at work or the, the, the employee that you don't know very well. Those friendships, those interconnected relationships, there's something about them that's very special in it. I would suppose that you know something about your friend without them having to say very much. For me, if I got to know them as a stranger, they may have to explain themselves in some way, but they don't have to explain themselves to you because you know them. You're intimately related. You sort of understand them. You get their gist. You understand their sense of humor and their fears and their anxieties. You know what gives them joy. And that's just what Jesus says in these verses. He says, if you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I've kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is the reason now that we do commands. This is the reason why we obey God so that we can know the joy of Jesus, because we know and love Jesus so much, we just want to make him happy. This is the covenant reality of the new resurrection life that begins now and will last for all eternity. There's something in each of us that we want to be joyfully submitted to God, that we want to make him happy. We hope and believe that he will enjoy our company because of the things that we do for him. And he wants to give us that joy. Look in these verses, he says, like, my joy, it's his joy. It's not just the reality that we will be joyful ourselves. It's also the case that he wants us to have his joy. What does that mean? Well, if you think of your friendships, if you've been with somebody for a long period of time, you start to pick up some of their traits and their characteristics. 
You might not be completely uh, enamored by the things that they enjoy, but some of those things will change, won't they? The, your desires change, your wants change, your hopes change. You might not even notice it because it'd be glacial over a period of time, but you'll start to love what other people around you that, are, that you're close to love. You'll start to enjoy some of the things that they do. You become one in a way. And this is the great news of the resurrection life, that Jesus Christ wants to give him not just any joy, wants to give us, sorry, not just any joy, but his own joy. He wants that joy that he has with the Father, he wants that to be in us, and he wants to reveal that to us. And in doing so, we no longer need to be employees. They, get, they don't get taught the master's business. They get commanded, and we're supposed to go and do that, whether we would like to or not. Rather, we are get him. Rather, we understand, we get the gist, we understand, we start to reflect the image of God in our life. We start to understand, understand the nature of what he wants from us. We start to have a distaste for sin. Even though we can't explain it or articulate it, there are certain things that we just know are not quite right and it's not of God. And there's certain things that we know, again, we can't explain it. Maybe we can't find a verse that says to do this, but we just get the sense that this is what God wants us to do and how he wants us to love other people. That is a new resurrection reality in Jesus Christ. So God no longer wants us to be slaves. We go to God in that condition. We go to him and say, I am nothing but an unworthy servant. But we hear back from him through Jesus Christ. You are now my friend.